fighter jets. Giant hornets. Can they fly? Yes, of course they can. Eggs. 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 Can they fly? No, absolutely not. <gasps> Hey, Kevin. Yeah, Daryl. What do you reckon about flying? Uh -oh. Oi, Tess! Stop bloody bouncing your sister into the coral tree! Mm -hmm. Bloody caviar! Sorry. Help? What were you saying? I was, um... I was just talking about flying. Oh, right, right. Why? Oh, I don't know. I just think it might be really interesting to see the world from that uh, angle. Wait, are you, are you saying you want to fly? Um, well, maybe. But you're an egg. Yeah, I know, but I, I could wear a helmet or something. Oi, Tess! Stop putting the bloody decorative pebbles up your nostrils! Look, Daz, I, I just don't think eggs are meant to fly, mate. <laughs> Ow! Tess, what did I just say? Oopsie. Simulator, where you can fly anywhere you can dream of, as long as you are not an egg. Please verify that you are not an egg. <sighs> Melanie, do you reckon I can have a go at flying your kite? Um, I don't know, Daryl. Isn't it illegal for eggs to fly or something? Well, yeah, maybe, I don't know, but I wouldn't actually be flying myself. I would just be, you know, holding your... Oi, babe, is... is this egg bothering you? Cos I'll end him if he is. No, sorry, I was just... Oh, my God, that's, like, so romantic. <coughs> Melanie, <coughs> you're kite. <coughs> Humpty Dumpty. Do you know why you're here? Um, uh, I tried to fly. You try to fly. And do you know what happens when eggs try to fly? Um, they have fun. This is the third time this year you've tried something like this. What's going on, Daryl? I, uh, Look, you're a good guy, Daryl. I'm gonna let you off with a warning. But this is the last time, okay? You should really get some help, mate. for housing tiny embryonic life forms that have evolved over millions of years to live in complete symbiotic harmony with one another. But can eggs fly? Yes, I think they can. 
Hey folks, if you've been interested in exploring in-camera VFX tools, then we've got a series for you. Now on the Unreal Engine YouTube channel, follow along with our latest set of tutorials to learn how to configure in-display, integrate CG environments with a practical set, stage operations, and more. Don't forget to download the sample project first, and then dive in. Our learning path for the Microsoft HoloLens 2 will help take you from a blank project to building immersive, interactive experiences in mixed reality. Learn to configure the engine for the HoloLens 2, create an engaging user interface, incorporate sound, and prepare your experience for distribution, all on the Unreal Online Learning Portal. Hungry for even more learning materials? Well, we're back with new tips for getting started with Epic Online Services. Dive into the platform agnostic game services where you will uncover how to authenticate players with the Connect interface. Head to dev.epicgames.com news to start connecting. After more than two decades of creating Sherlock Holmes adventure games, developer Frogwares is looking to the past to craft an origin story in their latest adventure, Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1. Uncover clues left by the team in our interview on how Frogwares' development of The Sinking City shaped their newest title. Unreal Dev Grant recipients Awaseb were inspired by their home in New Caledonia when creating the tropical island adventure Chia. Explore the vibrant game's physics-driven sandbox and learn more about the development process in our interview with the studio's co-founder on the Unreal Engine feed. And hop into the futuristic world of Fist, forged in Shadow Torch, a city full of eye-catching animals and combo-heavy combat. Thai Games shared their experience developing Fist and how Shanghai, Porco Rosso, and a love of Metroidvania gave birth to the Diesel Punk Adventure. Now over to this week's top karma earners. Many thanks to these rock stars, Clockwork Ocean, Every Nun, Coding Rook, JW Technical, S Lake, Devin Sherry, Churer, Shadow River, Funky Photon, and LFA. Create your own cozy cities while painting numerous islands in Reefland, a colorful city builder from Unsweet Games. Immerse yourself into a calming sandbox mode or go through 20 simple levels, picking up skills to better place your buildings and help your city grow. Wishlist Reefland now on Steam. Escape to the secluded wilds in our second spotlight. Using assets from Lot Pixel, Mountain House is a beautiful retreat with a warm natural wood interior to contrast the cool mountain gray exterior. Head over to their YouTube channel to see the full video and more of their work. Coming soon from Intermarum, feel the joy of turning the old into new again in Workshop Simulator. In the relaxing restoration sim, you'll repair vintage items while gaining a sense of nostalgia for the memories tied to these unique objects. Download the demo today on Steam and give it the old wish list while you're there. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. And welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host, Amanda Shade, and have a really awesome slew of guests with me today from Broad Digital. So we're going to do a round of introductions. First off, I'd like to introduce Jason. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason. I'm the Executive Vice President of Digital over at Braun. And then Monica. Hi all, I'm Monica Andrew. I'm a line producer here at Run Digital. Jumping over to Ra. Hi, I'm Ra Vincent. I'm a production uh, working with Run Digital on a couple of shows right now. Great, and Patrick. Hi, I'm uh, Patrick Finley. I'm an, an environment design supervisor, uh, also on a, on a couple of different shows right now at uh, at Run Digital. So today we're going to dive in and talk about how Braun Digital is using or applying live action visual effects and traditional animation techniques to produce really high end and beautiful content. Um, really excited for you all to see what you're uh, they're working on. And um, it sounds like we have a video we're going to share throughout the show, right, Jason? Yep. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, what this video is going to be is just a, a, a a family friendly friendly uh, exercise that we run for a, lo a lot of our new recruits. Um, it's essentially an exercise that we do for our stage crew that we um, have a little competition and we create an environment from scratch using mega scans. And at the same time, we start prepping our, our mocap um, interim office uh, stage to record and we are uh, with the goal of having a proper motion capture shoot running it through um, the capture process and shoot process uh, exporting it into the back into the engine doing virtual cameras and delivering out as a rendered deliverable um, all within the space of around 30 minutes or so so um, it's a, it's a great way to get our new recruits up to speed on um, all things from shoot protocols to how we all work in the engine uh, from beginning to end. Awesome. So if we can pull up that video, that'll just run along as we're actually going to talk about all yeah. things about production and developing animated television shows. So really excited to hear what that process has been like for you all. No, I mean, it's been um, it's been quite the journey. I mean, um, Rob was probably one of the first people that I've reached out to um, when we started this endeavor about a little over a year and a half ago. Um, and, you know, a little bit of background about myself. And then once we get into um, into the nitty gritty, I mean, you'll see that all these folks on this call, Patrick, Ra, Monifa, come from a variety of different backgrounds, from games to animation to um, live action production design, uh, visual effects, working at facilities, and, and so on and so forth. I personally come from uh, live action visual effects, being client side uh, on set for features and and come from a world of um, of real time and and um, and motion capture as well as uh, on set VFX supervision for um, great shows and smaller shows making the visual effects process a little bit less intimidating um, for up and coming filmmakers and um, one of the big things that you know happened in this early iteration of of um, this new conception of this workflow using Unreal at the core was you know, how do we really shape animation for the future? You know, sometimes animation can be a very, very long process and, you know, sometimes two, three, four years at the max um, to get one feature out. We were, you know, Aaron, our CEO and, and Brenda, our co-founder and um, president of Braun Studios kind of sat there and we were thinking, how do we bring the efficiencies of um, live action uh, television filmmaking, as well as features into this world, because it's been like this for a long time. And the answer really, really was unreal. And how how long it's, uh, you know, how, how many strides it's taken forward in the past, you know, uh, year, uh, five years, let alone two months. I mean, it's it's been a real, real exciting journey to see how far the engine has come um, since, you know, when we when we first started dabbling with game engines and in productions maybe five, six, seven years ago. So, um, you know, uh, what we did first off is really took the live action approach to these projects that we're making. And that usually stems from words on a page. So script, and then handing it off to Ra and, and how, uh, and, and that's, that's the next phase. We break down our scripts and find our production designer and then start conceiving the world. And that's where I'll kind of hand it off to Ra on how we even went around this. Cause I think there were some fun challenges where one of the biggest things that Ra and I were thinking about was in a live action world on the script, you're, you're usually confined to, okay, you have this location. How are we going to make it fit? How are we going to get this puzzle? Now with the engine, it's like, all right, here's a completely blank canvas, go there. So it was like literally building every single blade of grass. The whole and world, yeah. Words. Yeah, using, you, I mean, the one thing I'll add and then I'll hand it off to Ra is that, you know, Epic has made it so easy to, to um, essentially give us all the Lego building blocks 
to formulate these worlds in such an accelerated rate. So, um, you know, it, it's just an amazing tool to have using the ability, using the mega scans. And, and now I saw that you guys have surpassed 16,000 assets. It's just an incredible ju- um, spring off board or, or, or rocket ship, actually, I should really say, <laughs> into how production usually happens in a, in a traditional 3D sense or even a visual effects sense, you know. So off to you, Ra. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, you you hit the nail on the head there, Jason. The um, the access to unlimited possibilities is almost as daunting as trying to fit a um a, a shoot day into a location that doesn't work. So, you know, while we have access to all these wonderful things, we're also in a situation where we've got to um. Uh, we've got a environment that still has some version of spontaneity in it. And I can say with traditional animation, there's um, every chance to compose beautiful shots. Each shot has a, has a, a lot of um, attention paid to it. With the process that we've been using with our Unreal uh, levels is to is to kind of build environments and then go and explore them then go on a little technical scout with everybody and have a look at different angles and you know in more of a traditional live action process so we're you know our teams may want to build something like a ravine or a creek and I have a, an idea of what I'd like to represent as far as a, um, a scene blocking goes. Then you bring the DOP in and the director and give them an opportunity to have a little scout. They find the most beautiful, miraculous, different ideas because, you know, filmmaking is a collaborative event and it kind of takes everybody's kind of input to find those magic moments and having a kind of enough flexibility to have some spontaneous creative uh, results is kind of really why we're here why we love it so much and that's so, that's a great thing and the one thing that i didn't mention too is that when Ra's talking about these technical scouts and what you all see in the video here too is that we actually have people from all around the world uh, attending these virtually so in in the window you see there there's actually one two three four people inc- and five people including the performer on a set everyone else in those windows they're in vancouver they're in new zealand they're in colorado uh, uh, like even now, Patrick is in, in Florida, Roz in New Zealand, uh, Monifa's in Vancouver, I'm in LA, um, and Amanda, you're in, in, in Raleigh. Uh, but, mm-hmm. uh, but that's how we've worked. That's, you know, that was one of the biggest, I think one of the bigger challenges, uh, while we're saying adopt a lot of live action techniques, um, uh, but in a, in a very virtual world, because you know, what had happened, a little bit of back history, is that we actually, I, st- I came on um, after VFX souping a show for Braun um, at, at a time, and then um, I came on as a consultant to help streamline their connectivity between Vancouver and Los Angeles. That was, th- uh, that was at the beginning of 2020, and we started laying that foundation down, and then by the time March came around and April came around in May, uh, the world had shut down and we were actually ready to go with Perforce, with 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 all these systems up and running. So we we actually greenlit our show Fables um, right at the beginning of lockdown, which was insane. Like we and and luckily I, I you know, I cross my fingers every day. It's like, oh, man, what if we you know, I don't even like to think about that. But, you know, if we hadn't, you know, have, have laid that foundation, it would um it would have really, uh, you know, inhibited us from green lighting a show. And, but what it also did with everybody is that it allowed us really to 
think outside of just hiring within our confines of specific cities and it and which kind of led us to meeting people like Patrick integrating teams that raw knows from Wellington and Monifa where where Monifa brings in people from you know um, her vast experience in the visual effects world and production so from London to Vancouver to Montreal um, all those realms so you know, that's one thing I just wanted to emphasize. And, and as you can see in the video too, we're using all Quixel mega scans and just blocking together a rough uh, environment as we're prepping. So, um, and then, so maybe Patrick, this is your realm. I mean, you come from a art background and, and everything as well. I just, you're, you're, you're the one that's in the nitty gritty and, and also knows how to put, um, uh, you know, all, all of Raw's ideas into a CG form within the engine that's ingestible. Yeah, yeah as, as uh, Rob was sort of, you know, talking about sort of um, doing these tech scouts, you know, there's it, these are smaller shows. This isn't sort of a full full feature length an animation. And we've got a lot of concept work, but there's not there's not a, a, a key frame for every single environment. And so, you know, Ra communicates to us the, the kind of thing that he's looking for. And the environments team will sort of rough out something. And then, like Ross said, well, it's almost like we're getting in a car and we're, we're driving out into the, the countryside or the mountains in New Zealand and we're finding all these places and everyone's getting out and kind of looking at it. And we kind of decide what we like and, and do we want to raise these cluster of trees or do we want to move the rocks around? And it's, it's all sort of instantaneous. And, you know, we're, we're looking at fully textured trees and rocks and, and you know, leaves and ground and, and water. And it's, so it's all it's just, you know, such a good real-time feedback. And it, and it gets answers for the, the director of photography and the director and for Raw sort of so quickly. And it's, it's really kind of nice. I know. And this, the other thing, Patrick, is that I normally we'd be used to looking at sort of gray blobs and then trying to imagine what the gray blob is but actually <clears throat> with assets we're looking at beautifully rendered uh, finished objects and yeah. gorgeously lit and as we i mean i mean that's the one thing too is that when we come in and there is a world of no restraint I mean, it's that's why, you know, Monifa is such an integral part in this process from a production standpoint. You know, this is something that can also drive you insane uh, from producing it. But also, like, it's 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 such a different, different um, mindset. Like if you have a show, if you have a short film that is anywhere from 50 to 100 shots uh, that you're producing in the engine, that's one thing. When we have our shows that are upwards of sometimes 5,000 shots a show or series, you got to figure out ways to manage that. And, you know, um, I'll let Mon speak to her experience, but I mean, that's where from a production standpoint, it is so crucial to have that kind of organization if you're elevating yourself to a series level or even to a feature level or a multiple um, multiple features uh, at that time, because there is a method to the madness and but it's different also because we're we're changing things on the fly and everything's moving at a thousand miles an hour i mean yeah that's i mean monifa what do you, you that's that's kind of your yeah, world I mean, yeah it is it's my wonderful world i keep it close within me um it is it's so integral i think for our production team to be involved because if you're looking at a traditional uh, pipeline or process for a film or tv show you know jason as you're saying we're going from pre-production to production and then post. Um, but obviously you have all of these um, disciplines in and then you scramble it up and then add on it and you've got multiple moving pieces simultaneously. So within that, you know, we're having tech scouts with our environment team, with Ra, who's our production designer, with our art director, with our directors um, and DOPs. And in the meanwhile of that, we're preparing to shoot as you can see from the video in there, everything adjusted at the same time. You know, there could be a pause or, or something needs to change. Someone from the environment team can get in there, make it very quickly, you continue on shooting. So being able to track all of that and make sure the production team is aware is 
just continuously being on your toes <laughs> with every day, making sure that things are going through um, smoothly, as well as, you know, everyone's communicating with each other. Um, and I'm happy to say that within our team, bearing in mind everyone's working simultaneously, we're all in different locations, different time zones, um, the process of us working together, and I think what really helps is that we're all coming from different disciplines. Um, you know, Ra and Jason are coming from a live action. Um, myself and Patrick, perhaps in animation as well. I'm coming from a VFX vendor side. So we all have different terminology that's sometimes the same thing <laughs> when we're communicating this. And uh, going through this process with Unreal means that we're creating our own language at times and our own terminology uh, for certain things. Um, but it also allows us to learn from each other and then be able to take all of that and implement it into our projects moving forward, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and then there's on top of that and the, the, it all sounds so simple and eloquent when you say it, mom, but on top of that, there are about 50 <laughs> other layers of DI and, and, um, you know, sound mixing that go into this and voiceover yeah. and that, that require, you know, organization with talent and, it's just there's there's a lot that goes into it and making sure that you know when we're shooting on a mocap stage we're recording audio directly in the engine and and really making those robust um uh, changes into our workflow but yeah um, and with sorry with our team as well making sure that you know we have our one-liners we know exactly what's being shot the adjustments and the notes that need to be made to make sure that anything that is happening from shoot to us in post, where we're at right now with some of our projects, um, is integral. It's like keeping that um, muscle memory of everything as yeah. well and um, unreal on the go. Right, absolutely. I mean, the other thing that I think would be interesting for everyone, uh, you know, to hear too is like Rob, what do you what do you usually look for in a script, and then how do you communicate it to Patrick and for environment wise when you have literally a blank canvas and just swatches like what do you how do you even like put form mm -hmm. to you know anything so we uh, i mean we really still use a um traditional filmmaking uh format for production design in a lot of ways um especially the initial part where you know you have a bunch of pages you formulate your own uh, vision of the world inside your own mind and then try and communicate that with some traditional two-dimensional artists so we have um, like on, on a typical project we'd have like four or five concept people and they would they would give us just uh, indicative frames of the world that we're building but then from these things, we kind of break it down a little into what are the elements that are required to build a world uh, that you're describing. And so part of that texture, part of that is natural environments, part of that is character design. So then from those early concepts, there is another layer or a tier of artists who put together the next phase of um, two-dimensional artwork and the two-dimensional artwork then goes to feed uh, like Patrick's team who are, are uh, going to go and build these three-dimensional assets and possibly assets on the marketplace to uh, to fulfill the early concept phase. So those those initial concepts are kind of key to holding together the rest of the pyramid of ideas. They don't they don't they're not a solve all, but they are to put into the into a mood that guides all of the rest of the artists throughout their process. And the end result could be quite different from the beginning. Because actually, because it's a collaborative event, everybody brings their own nuance or their own interpretation of the artwork to the table. And the design develops. 
through those conversations. So it's it's still the same as filmmaking, except where the the part where you give over your plans to the construction department, you're giving them over to Patrick. <laughs> Patrick. And I, I think to to speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, it's kind of like we're, we're talking about this early sort of prototype and really almost like a pre stage where we're, we're looking at maybe some early blocking animation. We're looking at some some early space compositions and, you know, maybe there's even some grayscale models and blocking. And so really it's this pre stage, but but in a, in a traditional sort of CG pipeline, it's almost sometimes like a, a different company that's doing your pre for you. And then you go and you rebuild everything all over again on your end. But this, like we take that and we keep it, it's all an engine and we keep improving and iterating and constantly improving the characters and the environments and the lighting um, and, you know, the, the cameras and, and you just slowly start shaping this world to, to what sort of becomes what, what sort of the, the, the vision of, of what everyone's seeing. And so there's this massive efficiency and sort of, you know, going from this rough pre through final all in sort of the same scene i mean that's that's a really good point too it's that we work we work collaboratively on um a perforce server and because we have artists from all around the world um wellington like i said wellington uh patrick's in florida and vancouver and uh, literally everywhere it's it's almost like christmas morning every day you wake up you get <laughs> latest and then you open up the environment it's like holy moly the entire left <laughs> left environment there's a new building there and um you know it's it's so exciting because everyone can like and the other thing that i'll, I'll emphasize because of our our international crew you know ron i had an early conversation and 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 monifa and i too about really letting the artists have a little a, a more creative freedom um, uh, and let them taking their own environments. And instead of, instead of saying, okay, you, you only design this one wall, you know, here's the parameters, um, you give them a bigger sense of the world, give them access to the artwork and then let them go and be creative. And I think that's how we've been able to yield such beautiful results in our future upcoming projects. Um, because they do have that freedom to just create. And that's that's where I think, uh, and, and Mon, you can speak to this too, where there's a real efficiency to just let them on a, one, you know, point them in one direction, like the fuse and let them go. Um, whereas, yeah. whereas sometimes in VFX and traditional animation, we get so caught up in, okay, now that you've done this one little piece of the environment, check it in, da -da -da -da, do, you know, do all this um check in each let leaf is that approved is that approved you know sometimes we do get tra trapped into that and you know it it's, it'll be interesting you know from your perspective mon how how our you know, process has evolved yeah because i think when you know coming from a traditional VFX background as well there's certain areas where you are you've got your task you've got your amount of time that you need to get it done in um, and it's complete and you send it off and you, you pass it down to the other departments, you know. Um, within here, you're in your box and then you're just expanding and expanding and expanding at each time. Um, and us being able to talk to each artist and, you know, have a conversation, you know, what are you interested in? in what really drives you? What is um, a character that you might want to work on? What environment might you want to work on? Um, and again, yeah, giving them carte blanche to just take that, take the, the artwork and expand on it um, completely and pulling your own ideas and i think that is where we have fused together this like wonderful combination of people wanting to come and work with us at point digital um it allows you to have that freedom and that creativeness especially if you've been so much in an, an area where it's you know it's your task is what's given to you um and i think that that's not just from artist background as well I love my French diction, but you know, having that, that understanding unreal coming up, talking to Ra in terms of um, the art department they may need. I speak for I think a wonderful production team on the shows that we have right now. Um, that we've all absorbed this and learned from it as well, and it's given us uh, creativity um, to just expand what we're doing with our projects and our shows. Yeah, absolutely.
And, and I just want to kind of put your attention back on the video for now. So what we just did there, if you guys are watching too, is we're, we've successfully captured our performer on the stage, um, got that performance um, back into the engine. And I just, I was holding up an iPad and the beauty about the iPad is that it, that's your virtual camera. We use um, glass, box te glass box technologies, uh, Dragonfly plugin. Um, uh, they have a really successful per virtual production centric workflow where you could just shoot away. And, and that's the beauty of it. We do all of our camera coverage, you know, from the beauty of a, a, a small office or even behind the desk, because you can literally tell, you know, your, your, uh, your camera that every foot that I travel into in the real world, we can translate into 30 feet in the virtual world. So you can do techno crane shots, you can do helicopter shots, you can do anything your heart desires in an efficient way. Um, and, and that's where uh, one of the big lessons of restraint is, is starting to come in. Because what we found is that yes, while we can shoot every single angle possible in the world for a scene, sometimes you shouldn't because there's <laughs> just a lot to sift through and you know what what and, and i you know you guys can all speak to this too is that what i found with our artists it took a little bit of time but what we've really emphasized to them is that story always comes first you should have that script on your desk looking at the story and the narrative and what we're trying to achieve because that's how you should start thinking about your layout for camera shots or or anything from that perspective. And I think giving your artists that freedom uh, will let them really just blossom. And, and, and we've been seeing amazing, amazing results um, uh, te technology wise. I mean, ingenuity tools that are created. Um, and one of the big things that we've challenged our teams to do, too, is um, really integrate the live action workflow and and giving them more one-on-one -on -one time like a live action uh, show with people like Ra, who's very humble, but he's also a two-time Academy nominated production designer, um, backgrounds of uh, uh, The Hobbit. I know, I know, Thor, uh, yeah. Jojo Rabbit. And then, and <laughs> but I mean, giving those, those artists access to, um, you know, amazing talent, uh, both in, you know, uh, all the all these artisans that come around uh, has been really really great for us and uh, we take the same approach when we have our dps we have them in real-time lighting sessions lighting uh, not just with our lighting teams but with our environments teams so that when we get in there and um, dan mindel who's the dp on uh, star trek and star wars um, to name a few um, says hey patrick you know it would be really cool to punch a little bit of a hole in this wall back there because when we look at, when we have the camera look over there it's a dark shadow you know so we'll need to think about that for the future i mean and that's one of the things i mean from your perspective patrick uh, how's it been working with the tyrant raw vincent <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it, it's it's fantastic because you know I get to interface with with Ra and with, with Dan Mendel and with the directors, um, but it's also really nice for the entire team to also be able to sort of interact and spend time with and and learn from and be motivated by 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 um, you know Ra and everybody else. And it's it's really kind of something that normally you don't have the opportunity to do. And and you know I think because of this it it is nice. And like you were saying with, with Dan Mendel. Lighting isn't just about where you're placing the lights. It's also about the environment and, and it makes you sort of think about, okay, well, what sort of slight changes can we make to the environment to really make this a magical sort of moment and a magical shot? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been a great opportunity. Yeah, and with that light. Sorry, Rob, go ahead. Sorry, Jess, with that light, you don't have anything to look at. So, you know, it's not to be underestimated, the power of the lighting, especially in Unreal. Yeah. And so as that video came to an end, what, you know, what you're able to see is we are able to render that one shot out. Um, and that's just the performance part of it all. Um, so that 
technically that was only one shot we did. Uh, there were about five or six others that were there that we put in movie render queue and just churned out. So you can imagine it's as quick as one, two, three lens change. And sometimes, you know, at full piece, um, uh, we are able to churn through, like, like I said, around over a hundred camera setups a day uh, with a, in an eight hour session. So it becomes really, really robust and um, it becomes more of a, an editorial um, ingest <laughs> of, of, of all this data coming in too, you know, which is, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> but. So in our, in our everyday lives and live action filmmaking, how many camps would you expect, Jason? Oh, depends on who the director is. Let's just, I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Could you I give a range? A <laughs> I mean, some, uh, I've been on sets where it's maybe one a day, sometimes in the most extreme circumstances, but I think we would probably never get through, uh, I'd say maybe 25 to 30 would be a very, very ambitious day um, with setups. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that is that is like full blown. If it's television production, um, multiple like season five of a series that where all the crews know each other and they're just they have the system down. It's um, a well oiled machine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I just yeah, it's it's insane. I, I mean, just to think about the efficiencies and you know, I, and that's that's actually a good point. Like, Mon, for from your perspective in terms of output i mean the the idea of traditional workflow i mean you have to deal with all that stuff too <laughs> and in comparison like what from your, your... <laughs> well, well like honestly when you're thinking about it like it does give your it takes your mind a while to adapt um to the change in in what we're doing here is, uh, you know, previously you've got your your scans come in, everything comes in, you know, I wouldn't be communicating with Ra, I would know who Ra is, I'd be communicating with Jason, be like, thanks so much for the scans and the information, um, and the, the output that you get from it, um, you know, it goes through a process, comes through, you ingest it, um, it's going through animation, and then CFX, FX, then onto lighting, um, and with this, everyone is working at the same time. That scan or comes in, you've got multiple departments going at it, having adjust or having communications and discussions about this. So the output is is vast um, when we're looking at it, but also um, multiple departments that are working all at the same time um, is huge for me. Also fun and scary all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I think the best way, the, one of the things that we've discovered, um, and Patrick has probably the most experience in Unreal out of, out of all of us here, um, <laughs> is that, you know, I think the best piece of advice that I, I've heard and I will echo is that there's a reason it's called an engine. Like, you have to think about this as in what's the best fuel for this engine. So it's a gaming engine as a and in a whole uh, as a whole, and and we went through a, an iteration, uh, multiple iterations of different types of workflows, trying to really bring in a lot of traditional methodologies um, and structures and workflows, and it, it wouldn't it wouldn't get up to speed so much, you know. So and what we discovered is the more and more we adhere to game protocols game workflows structures of how we set up our project files um and the more we keep it within the engine the more streamlined it gets you know and, and even from the production standpoint of folder structures and everything um i i feel i feel that even our our production staff know how to at least navigate their way around find the answers they need and it's, it takes a, it takes a yeah it, it, it takes a a team that also wants to learn um, and the mentality is there uh, to want to progress things for the future and I you know and I think it's important for all of us to you know emphasize that the mentality is a huge part of how to make this successful moving forward. 
kind of on that note, um, sorry to interject, uh, someone from the community was sort of asking, you know, you're, it sounds like you're trying to streamline as much into engine as possible. Um, but they're wondering sort of like what methods and applications are you using as part of your new process and coupled with that, um, what ha you mentioned Perforce earlier, but how are you mm -hmm. managing your assets and, and version control systems through this, this world of being totally remote? Patrick, you could probably lay into that from your, how you go about that design taking from 2D and then into your fully fleshed out worlds too yeah. with your team. Sure thing. I mean, you know, pipeline wise, we're using a lot of the traditional tools where we're using, um, you know, your, your modeling packages like Maya or, or um, 3D Max, mostly Maya. And then we're, we're doing painting and thing in substance. Um, but really we're, we're, we're treating this like a, a game and we are, we're using um, Perforce and, and bringing in all of our assets that way. And if we need to roll something back, we're, we're doing it within in Perforce. We haven't found the need to have a large sort of complex version control system to sort of, um, you know, move assets up or back forward or backward or, or roll things back out. Um, it's been a pretty smooth transition, you know, maybe at some point it makes sense to, to move into like a USD. Um, but, but at this point we, we haven't felt the need to, to do that. Mm -hmm. And Patrick, you, from your modeling standpoint too, you, you provide the layout, you know, do you want to walk through of how you kind of go from, from that into, and, yeah. and how you hand off into yeah, the Yeah, sure. Sure thing. I mean, one of one of the um, the things that's been sort of most impressive to me is that, is that, you know, we still do make a lot of things in in something like Maya and, and bring it in. But we have found that there's sort of an amazing speed up in production when instead of building a piece of architecture outside the engine and then bring it in, we design a series of parts. And, and build a piece of architecture like it was an actual building, beams and bricks and windows and doors and create that kit and then take that kit and make a building. And then we can just vary that kit a little bit and make it again. It's, it's a classic sort of game engine kit bash yeah. and it has improved efficiency so much. It's, it's amazing and so eye-opening to see that we can take a few parts and make an entire village and not that much sort of time and overhead where traditionally it would take months and months and months of designing all of these different buildings and UVing them all and bringing them in and taking each building into substance. And so we get to cut out a lot of that and it's been really sort of eye-opening in, in, in that respect. Yeah. I always love hearing the like cross industry stories, right? It's like where now animation or filmmaking is benefiting from a lot of the uh, techniques that games have been using because out of necessity in a real time experience, but then, you know, uh, more traditional storytelling or maybe cinematography and all that is now moving into games as we're seeing these uh, skill sets cross paths and more collaboration from across the industry. So, I mean, that'd be cool, Rod. I mean, you come from like model making from rings and, and the first series of Lord of the Rings and now here, I mean, that would be an interesting <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. uh, opposed, you know, idea. <laughs> well, it's, it's like what Patrick was saying. You know, you you start off with a um, with a a bag of tricks, if you like, or a, a a bag of pieces, and it's the same with uh, set construction or miniatures building. You you have a um, a language that follows through for all of your textured surfaces all of the kind of architectural details and things that you that you picked or built in preparation for a set build it's it's kind of the same we use uh, repetitive molds for uh, doing architecture in model making for for live action filmmaking and we also use these same molds in the engine so uh the the language and the pro the process is very similar because you need to have a cohesive uh, visual language through all of your parts 
same with building a model of uh, Osgiliath, for instance. Or you know, you might want to um, you might want to branch out into two different worlds. What we're doing in um, our current project, we have very much a fantasy based uh, uh, kit of parts and reality kit of parts and we're, we're finding kind of through the work that we've been doing with um, like mega scans assets and some other uh, off the shelf components where there's a there's a, a version of reality which fits both worlds so we can step into fantasy but also ret retain the textures of reality through um, through the methods that we're using with the engine at the moment so I'd kind of I would say that you know you can think as big and as beautiful as you like but if you want to kind of uh, take advantage of what's available in the marketplace there is a version of this content which relies on real life or this the synth the um synthesizing of beautiful real and um, to to that, add to add on to that um you know using these these mega stands and these quixel assets you know say you've got a brick wall or a set of stairs that you've taken out um like the the the, the japanese shrine stairs and quixel you know mega scans we we like i love them they're great stairs. I try to use them whenever I can. But what's nice is you can, you can take those stairs and you can cut off the ends and extend it out and merge it in or make it part of a spline system. And all of a sudden you've got a huge staircase and then you can use the modeling tools and engine. You can sort of bend it or twist it or do whatever you want. So it's not just that you're stuck with the thing that in its current shape, there's, there's so much you can do to sort of morph and change it. And and make it into something to sort of, you know, get it in front of, of raw to say, yeah, that's, that's what I was looking for. That's what I wanted. And I mean, from a production standpoint too, it's like, usually when we're, you know, Monifa and I've been there uh, and you're sitting in a review and it's like, what happens if we move this tree a little to the right, just to clear it up and Monifa speak to that. I mean, the usual process, is like you have a, a team I mean, of production coordinators and producers ripping their hair out in the background. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, I mean, the simplest uh, phrase again, like moving a tree or what if we change that tone or the color, or I don't really like extra or something, you know, you're sitting in the back of a review session, like having hard palpitations. Like, I think, I think we can do that. I mean, just uh, see, see how long it will take. And in the midst of this, we are, on a call virtually talking to multiple people across the world and that moving tree is you finished your sentence and it's it's been a job you know um that point is, is vital it makes me happy every day um <laughs> it's, it's my and you're like okay this can work and it's feasible especially the, the where we're going with this technology um, so each time, obviously, and it, it definitely took me a while, you know, I think sometimes Patrick would come to me like, I want to make an adjustment. How many, how long is that going to, how many days is that going to be? Like, oh no, it's be a couple of minutes. I just wanted you to take a look and see it. And oh, okay. You know, so, um, it is a huge shift, uh, in terms of how we would do it traditionally, um, and making those changes so fast. So it does mean that, you know, our world updates evolves uh, so quickly, so much so that our artists do that themselves sometimes we're in a review and they say, I, I actually like the idea of they put it in here and, uh, you know, happy to see it and happy to see um, their development and progression as we go. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I've spent many, uh, I spent a lot of time as a compositor working in Nuke and I, you know, so many times I've had either the producers or the visual effects supervisor saying, no, like you cannot re-render. Like there's no time. It's going to take three days. The other stuff yeah. that's on their farm now won't get through. Everything's going to get backed up. Like do whatever you have to do in comp so that we don't have to hit re-render. Now it's so easy to just 
keep moving and tweaking and changing things. And, you know, maybe it's two minutes a frame to, to re-render the scene. So it's, um, it's really nice how, how flexible it is. Well, and to be honest, it's like, <laughs> well, also, it's, Use, Patrick. I thought we had worked together before, but yeah, that is exactly what I really like. We can't do that. Put it down. <laughs> Please put it down. <laughs> and and that's that's the other thing too. From you know, uh, Ron, I have worked on now five projects on, on set and on, on these projects too. And Ron's always the last one in there before camera rolls, like literally with a paintbrush painting the side of a wall that is featured in camera that we never saw before. And there's some sense of that that we're now able to do in the animation process, which, Ra, I think it's either it's either a, a, a relief or a, a complete nightmare from your perspective. <laughs> well, I mean, shooting wet paint is always, you know, one of the keeps us all awake at night. Um, <laughs> something that you can't do in in traditional. Um, filmmaking is really go back and change stuff after you've shot the performance but what what we've managed to achieve with this workflow is you know using um, motion capture and performance data and putting it into the environment kind of at the same time as we're building the environment that's like a whole new technique <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, awesome. Cool. Um, so, Amanda, did you have any other questions for us? What do you think? Um, they do. So, um, they were asking if you had uh, the Pork Chop Express, was wondering if you had any specialized tools you had to develop for your animation team or, um, you know, customizations to the engine to make uh, your workflow better. Uh, the simple answer is yes, um, because there's a lot of, uh, you know, the, I'll come back to car analogies because I'm a car person as well. It's like you have your engine and you build your Formula One car and you have your own little little things to make it run more efficient that work specifically within your race car um, that you think can can do it. But in saying that, yes, we do have tools, but we build them with the intent of them being flexible and being able to change later on. One of the big things, and I think one of the huge efforts that we have done is actually that I never want to kind of um, glaze over is the production tools. Like those are certain things that are such a, a, um, a foundational necessity for a large scale show that we've um, we spent a lot of time, our pipeline team and and one-on-one -on -one time with, with Monifa's production teams and our other Fables teams, production teams have um, have started to create a lot of things where simple things like tracking shots become an automatic process. Getting iterations back from editorial are are now you know populating into we use um, we use uh, shot grid as well. But there's there's a lot of organizational things that that just need to be tracked, frankly, and keep keep people on task. Um, yeah. We also have some. You know, we have uh, custom camera tools because we've taken the live action aspect of um, of cameras because I'm also I, one of my hobbies is cameras and lensing and everything. So we've actually taken some anamorphic primes that we've used on features and um, digitized them so we can use them uh, in our arsenal to create a very anamorphic type feel or spherical and, and bring in some of the the grittiness from live action productions and these lenses to our somewhat clean, um, clean uh, animated shows, but it adds this level of depth and and quality to the overall look that that you just can't put a finger on, but you just think it's cool. You know, it's it's awesome. So we have camera tools, and we also have a slew of on set capture tools that fit within our um, our needs. Like I said, one of the simple things is recording um with our you know our version of take recorder in, on the mocap stage that also re records audio directly mm -hmm. in but also when you hit cut it pop populates it into our internal file structure so that it's ready to go um so those are just the kind of uh, detail oriented bits that that we have done 
uh, so far, and I know I'm missing a, a ton of them, so I apologize, Jim and and uh, Ashwin on our on our pipeline <laughs> side. <if you're> <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd say one one tool that's been sort of critical is is having or some uh, a need that that I think is important for us is that having the ability to have a tool that loads the latest camera force, loads all the characters, loads the um, the, inv the correct environment and the correct lighting scene, and then not just on a per shot basis, but can pull that together as a, as a whole sequence in sequencer so that, that at any given time, any of the artists can go in and sort of load latest and scrub through and we can evaluate, um, you know, in the environment, what do we need to change for all these shots? Because the camera wound up getting much closer to this one window than we thought, and it needs more detail um to you know character changes and lighting changes and all that kind of thing and so yeah it's really easy to kind of see everything that anyone can get in and see see anything so it's it, that was really critical yeah and i think as well, just to add, no no just to add to that i think obviously we've been talking about creativity and our artists and such and uh that doesn't exclude the toolkit the tool rating like the level of creativity Activity that comes with that from our artists um, from all backgrounds. There's, there's multiple names that I could list uh, of everyone, but each department has created tools uh, for the benefit not just of themselves, but also for other departments and other projects and such. And I think having all of that in there for them has been hugely, hugely um, helpful for the rest of our, you know, Bond Digital, you know. Um, people are coming up with discussions, talking to the pipeline team. We have our, our CD Super Dave, who is constantly going through and checking in terms of certain types and tools that we use. Um, and that creativity stems from that interest in what we're doing into how we can encompass that and also put it into an ingest it into Unreal for us. So um, it's, again, thank you to the Brown Digital team. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think there's a bit of a follow-up on that load latest comment, and they're wondering if that's a totally custom tool, or is it an editor utility widget, or can you give a little more to that? Uh, which which tool was it? The production centric load, or, or kind a, of the scene? The load latest. I'll, I'll see if they can clarify. Oh, a little I guess more that's maybe that. the tool that I was I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, I, ahead, I, I'm not. Other than hitting the buttons on the tool, I don't know too much about it. I, I love it. I, I'm so happy it's there, but I'm not too sure about its development. So maybe I'll let I'll defer to Jason on this one. Oh, I'm the wrong person. I, I apologize. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of wow. amazing, um, talented, talented, talented folks on our teams. That um, um, I believe it is. Oh God! It's, it's the scene, the scene building tool, and um, yeah. it's a it, it's a pretty simple tool that was put together. I've worked at places that have had huge, enormous pipelines. And this, Braun Digital has a pretty thin, streamlined pipeline. It's simple, it works well, it's not overly complex. It's sort of like just the right number of hooks and plugins into sort of Unreal, into Perforce to sort of um, do what we need to do without being overly complex. So I'm, I'm impressed with its it, the, the lightness and flexibility of it all. And yeah, I think to give I mean, you a little bit more of a global perspective answer is that we're not, um, we don't say that we are creating tools in, in this software, or that software. I think anything that we can do, our, our first, our first um, exercise is to go is like, can we do this in the engine? Can we figure out ways to do this within blueprints? Can we do this, you know, uh, as much in the engine as possible? Because that's the way it works. But, um, but at the end of the day, we figure out we're not, um, we're not beholden to any specific way to do it. Um, we'll test it, of course, but if we found some new, I, I think that's the beauty about the engine and the community is that things change every single day, if not every single hour with, without the engine. I mean, the source code is out there to the world. So people are coming up with amazing tools on their own. Sometimes we even find some tools on the marketplace or anything that we implement uh, that work for a specific shot or or scene or, or something because you have it out there people have spent the time hard-working artists on a global scale so you know it's it's really this community that's been quite amazing for the tool set and getting inspiration as well love you <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so somebody from the community was asking, uh, what's your primary, or do you have a primary solution for particle effects? Um, are you leaning on Houdini? Are you building them in Niagara? Um, what's some of your process behind this? Who wants to take this? I can, I can sort of, um, both, yes. <laughs> yes is the answer. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at, at everything. Um, obviously, sure. Niagara is a great one. Um, you know, there are a host of sort of real-time tools. And we did some tests early on, and I was really nervous. You know, Houdini is this amazing package. It's heavy. There are millions of polygons when you're involving with these sims and gigs and gigs of data. Um, we did some tests and we were doing a, a waterfall and we imported an Alembic cache. And I think it was, you know, depending on the, the, the version of it, it was between three and five gigs. And we were like, there's no way this thing is going to work. And we were able to get it in, in Unreal, you know, 4.26 branch. Um, and yeah, I think the five gig version was still playing at 30 frames a second. So, um, you know, in a, in a stocked environment with, with, lots and lots of trees and rocks and, and architecture and buildings. And, it, you know, it's a huge scene and this Houdini sim would play for us. And then we even got to a point where we were loading, you know, there was the waterfall and then the river and then another little waterfall. And we had it all in there and it was all playing at 30 frames a second. And so, yeah, it was really kind of inspiring. And that's in Unreal 4.26. So I can't wait to see what happens when you bring that same thing into, into UE5. Awesome. Exciting. <laughs> uh, let's see. They're wondering, are you using UE as part of the pre-viz and storyboarding phase of your development? Yeah, uh, we definitely are. Uh, once we have our environments laid out and we'll, we'll go here, a little bit of an accelerated way we do it. We'll take a, we'll, um, we'll have our script breakdown of all the environments. Um, then we'll hand off, um, we'll break down each of the environments, hand it off to Patrick, get a creative brief from Ra um, or, and our director. Um, and then we start just kind of building things in gray, gray form, gray shaded. Once we have that form, uh, then we go with, at the, oh, at the same time we're creating this, this uh, gray shaded form of, and layout of the environment, we go on a virtual shopping spree, which is my favorite part of the process. <laughs> virtual shopping spree with our director on the Megascan store, and we go through um, location by location and get the download from the director and the production designer. What do you see in this hallway? Oh, mahogany, um, you know, bookshelves, you know, all these types of things, you know, real, and, and we'll click all of it, download it straight to the engine. Um, it's all being cataloged and gone through in the meantime, you know, uh, the layout is complete. And then once we upload every, all the assets that we've downloaded back to the, back to Perforce, we can now start assigning, um, to our lead environments folks. Okay. This is seen, uh, this is environment one. Um, this, these are the base uh, materials, textures, uh, environment pieces that we want to see. And it becomes like kid picks 15.0, you know, where you're literally dragging and dropping and coming up with that. And at the same time, what we can do, as you saw in the video before, is you now go in with your virtual camera, you take snapshots with rough placeholders, even mannequins, um, as the character teams are working on on sculpts. And then we start, we can go and literally start getting a feel of how blocking will work within our scene. Um, we still depend on, like for some of more our complex scenes, like a third act battle or, uh, you know, uh, scenes that really require heavy thought about blocking of battle beats and characters and where they lay out. Um, what Ron and I have done in the past is create a top-down map and you literally draw little figures and where they are and dots that move around because it's, it's, it's crucial to figure out those complex battles and how they pan out in the story. Um, so that's how we would do that. But uh, we would also depend on somewhat of a traditional storyboard um, pass if we needed to, but not cell by cell. It's more just broad strokes is what I would say. Is that right, Ra? Yeah, and it's really nice to be able to see that just from any angle, you know, mm. so you can set up every set up performance 
and before you even throw a camera you can just have a have a generic top down view or a flyer fly through and just see how different angles play out before you choose your cameras yeah and the beauty about doing those, those blockings in the engine is that we can save those locations, send them back to the environments team. Patrick will have an idea of where cameras are looking and then maybe spend more attention on those specific angles too. Sorry, Patrick, and I didn't mean to. I was just going to say it's, it's a lot like a game where, you know, you've got your entire world and you don't normally in, in, in rendered CG have the opportunity to have that entire world and sort of, you know, here's one village, here's the other village, here's the third village, here are all the roads that connect them. And, you know, everyone can kind of get in and get a visual on, on where everything is. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just sort of a nice sort of tool that we get to use to sort of begin to sort of pull all this together. Uh, how do you go about creating shots that feel and look like they are natural camera movements instead of like rigged camera shots? I mean, I would say the virtual camera process. Uh, there's, and, and you guys can speak to this too. It's just, there's some kind of organic nature that we like to keep within our shots that, um, I feel like in animation, everything is, is very, you know, uh, or, or anything that's produced out of uh, a computer is ones or ones, ones and zeros, right? And I think coming from a live action background uh, as well, like, and Ra will, will back me up on this too, is that some of the most beautiful things are accidents, happy accidents, like, mm -hmm. oh, that, 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 uh, that lamp started to flicker or something. And even though it was a mistake, it actually added to the, to the nature of the shot. So what I think that gives you, and, and you have to remember that we're all filmmakers, like everyone on this call is a, is a, a creative. It's an, we're, we're, uh, imagining things that don't exist or, or interpreting things in a way based off of a page of uh, words on a page. So, you know, art in itself is, is our happy accidents or, or it, it, it's very fluid. And I think adding that to that kind of handheld feel where you're not always measuring the pixels to make sure you have the perfect, um, you know, perfect framing aligned. And, and yes, we still keep in mind silhouettes and, and stay within these same rules. But, you know, one of the best things that we've learned from, uh, you know, our DPs as well throughout the years too, is that sometimes rules are made to be broken. Um, so we, we have a lot of fun with that and, and, um, really having an operator go in and like hand hold, um, some elements. And then if a, if a performer shifts their weight to the right and blocks it, you have that freedom to kind of bounce over here. But, but that kind of also triggers back to the performances that we're getting in, in motion capture. And that's why we, we use motion capture as a baseline for our performances, because there's some time, there's things there that the performers come up with and our live action directors come up with that we could never think of. And there's just certain moments and the way that I put it, one of the most beautiful things about a live action set is you have a huge stage, dark, big, empty stage with sometimes over a hundred people. And then what happens is that everyone starts to get quiet. Everyone calms down everyone. And then you hear roll and then everyone's attention over a hundred people start to hone in on that one moment between action and cut. And that is where it becomes magic. And I think that's what we're really, you know, trying to grasp here um, in, in the animation world and, and involve everyone and have everyone focus on that one image. Cause I think it's so, uh, the spontaneity is great, you know, in that sense. And it gives, yields the best results. You know, is that, is that right, Ra? <laughs> Did I do it? Yeah, that's very eloquent, Jason, very eloquently put. I mean, I think that um, that it is about a little bit of frailty in design and execution. You need some version of a human touch to to uh, to sell a really good show, and that extends to you know dodgy camera work and slightly off lighting. So an actor might break the edge of your frame as they're doing their performance cameras 
catching up. You know, there's a lot of new making that is really hard to design on purpose. So mm -hmm. using motion capture, using sort of full, almost complete environments, uh, they, these tools have benefited the stories that we're telling us, I believe. And, you know, the human mind is really only prepared to take so much information. So there's actually a sweet spot there too when you have access to unlimited design possibility you really have to hold back a wee bit because we don't want to we don't want to take over the narrative visually you know occasionally a scene wants to be a beautiful moment but it doesn't necessarily need to be jam-packed full of effects or amazing objects you know, it survive on a really beautiful score or the performance of an actor. So there's that stuff needs to be weighed against the capabilities of the Unreal Engine. Mm -hmm. You don't want to upstage the actual action or the performance of the environment. Yeah, I think I think the story, because the best the best way to put it is you can have a really cool shot. But if the script calls for, oh, and then she, you know, a single tear falls down his cheek, you know, you don't want a huge swooping in and zoom into the tear. It's just <laughs> this, you know, that's very quiet, that, very gentle. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the one thing that I think we all echo here too, is that story is key. This is story is so important. And, you know, it, it's just, it's the driving reason why we do what we do. Because uh, we are storytellers and filmmakers and passionate about what we do. You know? Great. Mm -hmm. um, mm. I don't know. It's, it's so fun hearing about all this. So it's exciting <laughs> to have you all here and, and talking about it. Um, someone was wondering, what are some of the best techniques you feel have been brought to the studio by artists who have worked in real time at other studios? Mm. I know. Monica, you could probably do that. We have a, a there is a there is a <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't want this to be like a cop out of an answer, but just their knowledge, you know, just the knowledge of everyone and the, the inclusivity of it is is key to us. So you know, it could be from. Um, something that they learned previously um, at a game studio that we're implementing. Or it could be um, even an idea in terms of keeping our crew together in a meeting and having discussion about something. Um, I think the main thing to take from the knowledge from everyone is, you know, it's not about like taking from different studios or places that you've been before, just absorbing the good sections of it and adapting it into something uh, that we have here um, and making it our own. So I'm, I am, you know, everyone's, there are so many, there really are so many in terms of tools that come through processes. Um, so the knowledge that they bring with it and, and also us being open to just hear exactly what they're saying and what they're working to adjust to. Um, multiple things from, you know, Adam tools on hands um, and adjustments on that, that when you're dealing with mocap, obviously, um, you're doing a lot of clean work and such. So, um, yeah, knowledge, 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 knowledge. And not being, not being so, so um, you know, focused on one way of doing things. And, you know, I think yeah, that's what you, you're trying to Patrick as well. The mentality, it cannot just be straight, you know, like this or what I've previously learned and that's all I've got. You have to be open to um, everything that can be absorbed in the engine, you know, everything. You know, Mm -hmm. And and I think we even sort of started out started off this show with a bit more of a traditional sort of CG pipeline, and then as we we sort of moved along, you know, we sort of evolved into sort of a, a much different pipeline and more of a of a game centric pipeline. And you know, like I was saying before, like harnessing the power of of kit bashing and 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 components. Uh, for to build architecture and using the spline tool to sort of create roads and bridges and and other sorts of things and um, 
and then you know instead of having a 4k texture if we got up really close to something an 8k texture we would use tileable textures and vertex painting and and then you know using decals and other things and and to sort of really begin harnessing more and more of the things that make a game engine so efficient um and and using them on our end and and just sort of letting us giving us the ability to build out these worlds um that that we can still sort of get in and navigate around and and so yeah it, it's been it's been sort of a gradual evolution that's awesome uh yeah so oh go ahead no no well i i think i have to say from my part like starting over a year ago with unreal and and learning a whole bunch of processes i had, i came from no understanding at all so in a way the kind of pipeline was built on this sort of, of let's put all the tools and create a new way of thinking about and make a film and how mm -hmm. we make this into a television show using all these uh, amazing tools that actually we could build a brand new bow and yeah. and, and be tailored to different artists uh, strengths mm -hmm. We have people from um, architecture backgrounds and uh, sculpting backgrounds, 3D mod, um, Unreal projects, uh, CFX artists. You know, not everybody has been um, in this mode for a long time. Quite a few of us are quite fresh, but we bring with us a career's worth of knowledge and we're just using a different tool set. Yeah, I think that's the other thing. Great thing to mention too is that everyone right now is still learning. Nobody's an expert, triple A expert. I mean, and that's the other thing to understand. Everyone's starting from the same level, and now's the time to have to really get up to speed with knowledge. And that's a great thing about this community too. The information is out there. You know, I mean, the fact that we're you know talking about this on on this platform too. I mean. We've watched this show a bunch of times and tried to get inspiration and figure out ways how to how to you know streamline our pipeline. So the fact that you guys have such an amazing educational platform to back up the technology, we use it every single day. I mean, as soon as we log off, I mean, I I know I I check out a few like what's new, you know, and, and it's that that's one of the things that I think is so important about this community as a whole is that we want to continue to share information because. It is the way of the future. It's going to be uh, the next generation of filmmaker, the next J.J. Abrams, the next Jim Cameron, Steven Spielberg. will probably have had some experience within the engine. And it's, it's so uh, exciting for us to see because now they can actually create worlds uh, and, and experience things and mess around without having to go out and spend thousands of dollars on a, on a short or anything. You can do it here, you know. Oh, thanks. We're excited to see what you do. <laughs> We're just going to clip that and like put it in a little testimony <laughs> on <the> call today. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, uh, I think we've touched on this a little bit. Um, we're asking about the animations done in DCC tools, and we had referred to Max and Maya um, versus within the engine. Um, but they were wondering if built in DCC tools, then do you pass on the level layout from the engine to the animators for their animations? Or like, what's the workflow to match up those animations um, in engine? Do, I can take this one. Um, yes, we do. Um, we'll get our, our environment and sort of export out an FBX from engine so that um, they do have sort of the latest environment. And then whenever there's, if there are any sort of massive changes or, or building changes or anything that's gonna affect animation, we make sure we re-export the world or the portion of the world to the animation team because they are sort of working on their end in, in Maya or, or some other sort of package. Perfect. Thank you, thank you. Um, let's see. So, 
stepping back to more like general advice for folks that are excited to get into the industry, um, what would your recommendation for something that's excited to start developing animations like this or joining larger studios to produce um, these kinds of works? How do how do they get in? What do you feel like are their best best paths to success? Education. I mean, literally, you Epic has made it so easy to download the engine, uh, run through tutorials, uh, get an entire Quixel. Uh, environment up and running within, you know, four hours or so, even if you're, uh, I stumbled upon a video the other day where it's literally the basics of, of UE, but then at the end of a four hour session, you have an entire village and a, a forest and everything. It, it was amazing. And I just say, make that effort to educate yourself on the engine uh, and, um, and be okay to express yourself within it because um, uh, yeah, I, I think I speak for everyone as the artwork speaks for itself, uh, whether it's, and you can do it now. Um, you can, you can really create things that are in here. And what we respond to most is not just, you know, uh, credentials or anything, but really work product, something that you're able to start, you're able to power through all the technical difficulties and ultimately deliver. Like that is the ultimate thing in, in everything is that you were able to create something um, from zero to something beautiful. So, you know, I would say keep that in mind and use all the tools in the in this community uh, to your benefit and start creating. You know, that's that's the best thing that I could say as a whole. I think um, if you as well, uh, the, you know, the virtual production field guide as well you know depending mm -hmm. on where you want to go that is so informative in terms of learning like jason was saying it is so easy for us to download unreal and just test certain things out whether it's good whether it's bad whatever you think about it i think what also is great is sharing it no matter what your result was at the end share it share it on your platform share it on you know social media and certain things because that also is where where people are looking as well it's not yeah. just you know in professional platforms people are looking everywhere on any type of social media platform um, and seeing what you're doing and something that you might be sharing could easily someone reach out to you and be like hey they're interested in this how did you do it so and i'm going to throw in a shameless plug we are starting our third project and we are actively hiring so <laughs> if there's any <laughs> We are we are literally in real time on the hunt for amazing talented artists who are passionate about what they do, and yeah. uh, we would love to uh, yeah I'll reach out to the website and the recruiting page and and uh, we're looking so yeah excited to eventually meet some of you out there. <laughs> and that's from studios .com, right? Correct. Correct. Awesome. For all those prospective hires out there. <laughs> Shameless plug. You can write it down. <laughs> Bronze Studios. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, oh, we have another technical question. This is probably um, what was what did, what was your workflow for character rigs themselves, um, especially with if you had any complex uh, deformations and animations. Um, so. I can only speak to um, a little bit of a higher level, not nitty gritty of technical, sure. um, but we went through an iteration process. We tried to really adopt um, some traditional rigging techniques, but ultimately at the end of the day, like Patrick said, with um, you know workflows in general in the entire pipeline, the more we started to cater to what worked well in the engine, the better the results were. So uh, once again, Epic and Unreal have made it so great to provide things like control rig uh, to your disposal and provide a lot of infrastructure. And working within those, those parameters and trying to figure out clever ways to um, you know, create custom rigs that also speak to the rigs that work well within the engine uh, is, will always benefit you moving forward. So I can't get in the nitty gritty because that's not my department and I don't want to misrepresent, but uh, feed the engine what it likes. Use the, <laughs> use the premium, use the 91 <laughs> or the battery. 
also important. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, so we're coming up on the end of our questions. Do you have um, other items you'd like to share? Um, any last words of wisdom? I know we've also, you've referenced your project fables, but you didn't actually share what it was. So do you want to give a little intro ah, on what that project true. is? Yeah, so I, um, we just released a little sneak peek of a spotlight yesterday. Um, so Fables is a reimagining of classical stories like Aesop's Fables, like uh, uh, The Tortoise and the Hare, Three Little Pigs, um, Boy Who Cried Wolf. So we're using that um, using that basis and telling eight unique stories, um, uh, eight 30 minute episodes, uh, and uh, and producing that all within the engine. So it's uh, it's exciting. We had a really fun cast announcement yesterday. Um, uh, Ricky Gervais is narrating. We also have uh, Timbaland and the Beat Club team producing music uh, for the show. Um, so a lot of great talent. Check out some of the the announcements that we do have. Um, but yeah, it's uh, lots more exciting things to come um, with that. Also, it's going to be paired with an interactive game um, to use the engine to its full potential. So yes, that's uh, keeping your out uh, top of the year on where to find all this, all this lovely content. And yeah, I definitely encourage all of you all to check out that, that spotlight. The video is really fantastic and I'm really excited to see the art. The, the visuals are absolutely stunning. The animation looks great. And so I'm really excited for the opportunity to see the full show. And I hope the community is too. It's, it's fantastic. So you all should be really proud of the work that you're producing. Oh, thank you. And we also have one other show that we are current, the, this current group is also working on. And then another one, like I said, coming down the line that has officially started pre-production. So it's uh, exciting times and keep an ear out for those upcoming ones. We're announcing them soon. <laughs> awesome. All right. Yeah. Any last words for our community? You all good? Nothing. Thank Nothing you. <laughs> <laughs> the, it's the future, and the future is now, and we're going to learn some great stuff and make some great content. Thanks. <laughs> oh, thanks for I, thanking me, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess w one thing to, to sort of speak about sort of, you know, the work that um, Epic is doing with Unreal, and I, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, Unreal in a, in a different industry, and th it's interesting, you know, that, that Epic is sort of spreading its resources out into so many different industries, you know, the, the auto industry and, and education and AR, VR and, and film and, and, of course, games. And it, like that innovation is all sort of spreading out to the, all those different industries. And then it's just kind of folding itself back in again and coming back in and, and benefiting all of those industries. And so it's just, it's, it's a wonderful time to see and watch what's happening with Epic right now, because, um, you know, really is so exciting to, to kind of see these, these things kind of coming, coming together. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, really thank you. All so much for joining us. This has been um, really eye opening and a lot of fun to hear about your new workflows and pipelines um, for the community. You know, if you haven't downloaded Unreal Engine yet, go snag it and start creating your own worlds. And maybe you'll be working at Braun on one of these amazing features one of these days soon. Um, we'll be dropping a survey in the chat. Let us know what you thought of today's stream, what kind of topics you'd like to see in the future. That's the best place to. Um, give us your feedback on that. Do follow us at on all of our various social channels. It's at Unreal Engine or slash Unreal Engine. You get the idea. Um, and you know, if you're streaming on Twitch, please use the Unreal Engine tag, and that way we can find you and see what kind of great uh, projects and things that you're streaming of your own development. And we will not be here next week, where our team is out on holiday for Thanksgiving, but we will will be back the following week with um, Mike Prinky. So hope you're excited for that. But thank you all so much again for joining us. This has been an absolute blast. And I hope maybe we can have you on again in the future one of these days. We'd love that. <laughs> That'd be great. Right. Thank you so much, Amanda. Really appreciate it.
All right. Thank you all. Thanks to the community for coming and hanging out with us. Have a wonderful couple of weeks till you see me, till we see you next time. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.